for those of you already in the conference, we'll uh, get started shortly. Thank you. Thank you for joining today. We will get started shortly. Hello, thank you for joining today. My name is Andy James and I'm the Chief Product Officer at Blueware. Today I'm going to talk about some of the capabilities of VDS, which is Blueware's volume data store. VDS is a cloud native data environment that really allows a lot of flexibility in the, in the cloud, including storage of data and cost reduction. The agenda for today is a little bit of a recap on a webinar that I presented a few weeks ago on OpenVDS. In that webinar, I talked about different cloud storage, and we'll recap some of those key elements that are important for this webinar going forward. But I really want to focus on some key features within VDS itself. Our commercial version has the ability to apply compression, and there's a really unique feature uh, that we call true lossless compression. And then I'm going to talk about other compression options. And a feature that I really like is adaptive streaming and how I can deliver data into workflows to support this particular need of the workflow. And remember, seismic data is big and uh, Blueware VDS really enables you to deliver a seismic data revolution because it's been designed for the cloud. One of the things I talked about in the previous webinar was different types of storage uh, methods in the cloud. The cloud is primarily built on object storage. In the last webinar, I talked about OpenVDS being a cloud native format. We designed it from the ground up to work in the cloud, for the cloud, and fully leverage all of the capabilities of the cloud, like the massive scaling, the ability to do multiple asynchronous re requests and really deliver data into workflows in a fast way. One of the key elements is that we have a serverless based API. And when I say ser serverless, I don't mean lambdas or Azure functions or anything like that. I mean true serverless where the client is interacting directly with the objects and ultimately this means that there's no cost to serve up data into the workflows and I'll show you some of that a little bit later. So that's what I wanted to recap on the OpenVDS webinar. If you haven't seen it, we have a recording on our website. Um, I strongly recommend you uh, check that out. So first, I want to set the scene around some of the VDS capabilities. OpenVDS, which is open source through the Open Subsurface Data um, Universe, OSDU, is, um, has many, many features. And you see here from the table, there's features around writing VDS, storing VDS, and reading VDS. 
But what I want to focus on is a couple of key differentiators between our commercial version. And those are the ability to apply compression, including true lossless, and also adaptive streaming. So we'll cover those today. In our first use case, I want to talk about data preservation. How can I take SegWi, apply it to VDS, but always know that I can get back to the SegWi file in a binary equal version? And this is where true lossless plays a part. The benefits of our true lossless compression, it typically yields a 25% reduction in file size. And so this is quite significant in terms of costly cloud server storage. It is true lossless, so I don't lose any data. And it also supports the delivery through adaptive streaming at any signal quality and any compression ratio. And I'm going to really focus on that in my third use case, so I'm not going to cover that now. It can also be converted back to an identical SegWi, and I'll show that live in a demo here. So in my demo, I'm going to take a SegWi file, I'm going to convert it to a VDS, I'm going to view that VDS in a Jupyter Notebook, and I'm going to convert the VDS back to a SegWi and then perform an MD5 checksum against the data to compare that I didn't lose anything, true lossless. So in my folder here, I have uh, two, two folders for my SegWi data and my VDS data. I'm going to look in the SegWi folder and I have a very small file. So I am working with files here, just bear that in mind, but later I'll be working with objects in the cloud. It's 421 megabytes, so it's a very, very small seismic survey. It's a 3D post stack survey. So I'm going to set up the first step, which converts from SegWi to VDS. And you can see here, I'm using the uh, VDS file as an output with SegWi here as an input. And I'm using our wavelet lossless compression. As I said, it's a small file, so it converts very, very quickly. OK, so going back to my file browser here, I'm just going to use the search to traverse both folders here. Makes it nice and easy. And if I search for full amplitude, what you'll see here is the VDS file that I created and the SegWi file. So here's the 421 megabytes and here's this, which I think is about 77 percent, um, roughly, uh, roughly 25 percent savings. Now, bringing up Jupyter, Jupyter is a really fantastic tool for running Python in an interactive way where I can see the results of my, um, my code as I go. So in this first step, I load the Python libraries. And I run this command. I then run the uh, set up the project, which is my workspace that I'm going to work on. And now I open a connection to the file. At this point, I'm not copying the file into memory. I'm just loading up that this is the file I'm going to be working with. I don't have to copy the data into memory in order to work with it. VDS supports lots of uh, metadata, so I can get all the information about the survey itself and the size of it and the various different aspects of things. So you see it's 366 megabytes of trace data in this survey. And now I'm going to enumerate through the channels. We store things in channels, which is really cool. And you see here there's the SegWi trace header channel. And this always exists and gives me the ability to just query trace headers through an API. And ultimately, I could produce live trace outlines from uh, 3D surveys if I chose to. So the SegWi um, text header is also contained within the VDS, and this is all queryable through the APIs, really easy to do. And then I can look at this, the coordinate system of the data as well. So this gives me the overall size of the 3D survey. And then the next step here is really important. This is an accessor to the data. This allows me to create the asynchronous reads to the data that I want, the random access capabilities that we can apply to, uh, to the VDS. The next section here I'm going to run is 
going to actually plot my data just to show you that my VDS is really some live data. So that's a quick run through some VDS APIs um, to actually get to the data. So now I'm going to run a second step, which is to convert my data back to uh, SegY. And I'm calling the file here roundtrip.segwire. So I don't want to overwrite my original SegWire file. And this is what I'll use for my comparison. It's a very small file, so it doesn't take very long. So if I now go to my data folder where I'm storing my SegWire folders, SegWire uh, files, you can see my two files here is my full amplitude file and my round trip SegWire, which I just created a few minutes ago. Now, also in here, there is a tool which is allow, going to allow me to compare those files and give me the MD5 hashtag for the data itself. And so I'm going to apply this to the full amplitude file and do the same command against the round trip file. And you will see here that the hashtag is absolutely identical. And so I was able to reduce my size by 25%. Advanced slide. So I was able to reduce my size by 25%. I was able to preserve the full segue within there and get back to the data without any loss. But also I'm able to access that data through APIs, Python, C++, .NET, and also Java. In this version, I showed a VDS file. So VDS can be portable. But what I really want to focus on is the fact that the um, VDS is a cloud native format as well. So when we upload a VDS to the cloud, it's fully cloud native. And I'll show you that a little bit more in the next uh, section, in the next use case. And I'll show you, show you that fully applied in the third use case. So the next thing I want to talk about is adaptive compression. How can we compress to meet your storage and workflow needs. In this first example use case, I compressed to our true lossless compression, which is the second column along. The legacy format uncompressed data was 100% and I saved typically 25%. Now we target a tolerance, a quality tolerance. We don't target a size. Noisy data will typically yield a bigger file, less compression. So it's, it's, um, it tends to vary based on the data. But with VDS, I can also choose different levels of compression as well. So if space or data transfer over um, a low bandwidth link is a priority, I can use a compression of a higher, higher um, compression ratio to yield a smaller file. And if my workflow is only going to do visualization, I can actually create a file that is 2% of the size and use that for just visualize, visualization as well, if that's all I want to use the, the file for. So what I'm going to do is in this next step is actually show you different levels of compression. Now, I created two of these versions earlier. Here was my original VDS, and I created a virtually lossless and also created a near lossless version as well. You can see the virtually lossless here at 192 megabytes, and you can see the near lossless at 129 megabytes. So you can see the, the size difference of um, compression being applied. I'm going to create a more aggressive compression ra um, ratio here and call in this sum loss. If you can see that over to the left of the screen on the second line, this is sum loss. So once again, it's the same file. It's very quick, so we'll do this interactively. And it's created full amplitude sum loss VDS. So switching back to my file browser here, let's do a quick refresh here, and you'll see that uh, the sum loss file here is uh, around about 20% um, of the file size. So that's pretty cool. So in summary here, VDS can be compressed at different degrees um, based on our compression methods. In a future webinar, I will talk about the difference 
um, and the impact on quality for compression and signal quality. But I'm not going to be able to have time to cover this today, but it's definitely something that I want to cover in the future as I know it will come up as a question um, down the line. The key thing here is it's important to choose the right compression level. Only true lossless gives you the ability to go back to the uh, original segway. And so choosing a compression level lower than that um, won't allow you to go back. So it, it does create a, um, almost a burn, if you like, from that point onwards. But it's good for using it for specific functions and specific workflows, but you need to understand the implications of that. In the table here, you see, um, you see the uh, various different sizes of data and how it compresses at different levels here as well. And also um, the cloud object in VDS, I created one just for the statistics here. The cloud object also um, yields right around the same. There's a 2% overhead for the objects in the cloud, um, but very, very little. So it's about the same size. In the last use case, I'm going to talk about adaptive streaming. Adaptive streaming is one of my favorite features of EDS. It's the ability to retrieve data at an at at adaptive signal qualities based on the workflow. And this really, really plays into how we store data and then how we actually use it in workflows. If you think about the video and movie industry and how we watch TV, this all started with VHS videotapes. In the 90s, compression came along. In the 2000s, cloud computing came along and, and companies like Netflix, Hulu, Prime Video and YouTube really have revolutionized and transformed the experience we have today in, in terms of watching uh, TV and media and streaming services. If you think about applying that same pattern and analogy to seismic data, a lot of our seismic data today exists on tapes and offline storage formats. And people are thinking about moving it to the cloud, but you really need to think about, is it going to be usable in the cloud? And this was a key emphasis of my previous presentation. VDS coupled with compression, coupled with cloud computing, really gives you, you the ability to transform experiences for your seismic data. I'm going back to the compression chart here, and what I'm going to focus on in the, this use case is true lossless again. True lossless gives the ability to not only go back to SegY, but to go down to any compression level to the right of it. For example, if I create a new near lossless file using compression, I can only get more compression, more, uh, less signal quality from that data. With true lossless, it gives me all of the signal quality at any point, and I can use adaptive streaming to stream that in, into my workflows. And so for this example, I'm, I'm going to show you a true lossless data set. The benefits of this, it gives me one data set, not only for preservation of data, but also delivery of data into my workflows. I can deliver a signal quality that is equal to or less than the signal quality that I've stored the data at. And we've done some benchmarking and we can deliver that data in the cloud on cloud virtual machines at nine gigabytes per second, which is absolutely phenomenal in terms of performance. And we do that through leveraging cloud technologies, the ability to massively parallelize the data reading capabilities and really do a lot of asynchronous work on the background as well. And it's highly, highly optimized in how we get the data. So in this demo, I've upped the ante a little bit. No more playing with 431 megabyte data sets. I'm actually going to use a 1.2 terabyte pre-stack 4D survey, which has been compressed with our true lossless compression. Remember, I can get back to a segue from this data. The data is stored on Azure Blob Storage, but equally it could be stored on Amazon S3. 
And I'm going to view that VDS within Jupyter Notebooks, which I showed you earlier. The Jupyter is running on an Azure virtual machine, and I'm going to do, um, stream that data into a Jupyter Notebook at 50x compression, and then I'm going to change it and show you at 20x compression as well. I'll do various reads of that data, including 16 depth slices as well across multiple traces. OK, so you can imagine that's actually a pretty intense workflow to be able to do um, in, in any stretch of the imagination. OK, so here I go again. I start with my Jupyter notebook. I set up the uh, environment that I'm going to use and I create the project. Now, in this case, I'm using, you see there's a URL for the connection because I'm using a blob store for my, for my data. I've also added another command here, which gives me the ability to set adaptive compression ratio at 50. All of the other data is pretty much the same. I set up the, ACE, uh, the um, accessor and, and here is the data. This is a slice through the actual data set. So remember, this is 1.2 terabytes of data that I'm reading here. Um, or the data set is, but I'm only really reading what I need to support the workflow and streaming that. Here's my 16 gathers across a cross line. And so this is a, a pretty intense workflow, but I, because I can do this asynchronously, I can really stream data quickly into my workflow. The next thing I'm going to do the same thing, but do it across a depth slices on full offset on cross line 61. So I'm picking one cross line and doing depth slices all the way across here. And so the performance is absolutely phenomenal because I'm able to use compression um, to deliver that data as well. If I need more data, I don't change the data set. I don't reconnect to anything. I simply ask for a higher signal quality. And so now the same images appeared but I'm getting more signal quality in terms of delivering this data into the workflow. It really wasn't that much slower and I can even uh, move it up even further if I need to as well. So that gives you an example of using VDS in the cloud, in, in Jupyter, in these Python work, um, environments here and just using adaptive streaming to get the data from a massive, massive 1.2 terabyte data set. So adaptive streaming really is an efficient pattern. We don't preload the whole um, data set. We have a theory at Blueware that we bring the computation to the data, not the data to the computation. No more copying the data around into your workflows, creating new versions of it. We can use BDS to basically deliver the data directly into the workflow. In a future webinar, I'll talk about how we can deliver it in formats that are compatible with the typical GNG applications, things like patrol formats and paleo scan formats as well, and delivering that data in a high performance way into those types of applications as well. So I'll do that in a future webinar. So I'm not preloading the data set. Um, I only read the data that I need for the particular request, and I read a signal quality that's appropriate from, for the workflow. If I'm using visualization, I don't need full signal quality. My eye just can't detect that. If I'm doing a computation in conjunction with that visualization, I can make two requests, one to get more signal quality, one to get less signal quality. And also we use full capabilities of the cloud to do asynchronous request capabilities as well. I do want to remind you about the fact that we don't use a server to deliver up that data. We're not using Lambda functions. We're not using Azure functions on the server. It's pure object store. Your data is in place and the client knows how to read that data and reassemble it through our APIs. And so that's an important thing because Lambda and Azure functions, they cost money. They're, they're really lean, they're really lightweight, but they do cost money to deliver that data. Now in the next teaser here, I'm going to show you an example of what happens if I do use compute. And we're using Blueway's compute plugin capability. What I'm actually going to do is on the fly, create a stacked volume. I'm creating a fast stack, a near stack, and a mid stack 
volume directly on the fly from that 1.2 terabyte data set. So this is in the same Jupyter notebook I created earlier, and I can essentially deliver this data into my workflow really quickly or create specific volumes on the fly from this data as well. So this is a little bit of a, an eye opener to what I will do in a future webinar as well. I think I counted three of those I have to do now. So in conclusion, um, true lossless compression preserves the segway while delivering adaptive streaming and all of that capability. And Blue Wave VDS really exploits the cloud. So even if I've got 1.2 terabyte massive data set that's pre-stack, I can deliver that data into workflow to support my workflow needs. So just want to remind you, based on my previous webinar, no elephants were harmed in the making of this, imp um, this uh, presentation. And Blueware will also donate a dollar for each attendee uh, who attended today to the Elephant Conservation Organization. If you choose to uh, do that, to help yourself, you can go to this URL and uh, either match that dollar or, um, or add your own, uh, your own donation there as well. So next there, we'll move over to um, Q&A. And if you can write your questions in the, in the chat window, we'll, um, we'll happily answer those. I did invite uh, our CTO, Paul Anderson, to join today. Uh, so when the really hard questions come along, he'll, uh, he'll help me out uh, there. So if you've got some hard questions, please feel free to, uh, um, to exercise him versus myself. That'll be great. So one of the, the questions that has already come in here, thank you. Um, as workflows change over time, do you find most clients choose lossless? This, this is a really interesting question. I think understanding cloud storage is really important. You may want to preserve, use true lossless in um, an archive format. There's different storage tiers in the cloud, and this is where the last webinar is really important because it talks about um, archive versus online storage, um, hot and cold tiers. You can use the true lossless in your archives for incredibly low cost and bring online versions that you need. Um, we've had multiple companies testing our, um, our, our compression and they typically say virtually lossless will support all of their workflows needs. The detail of this really only applies when you start looking at the spectrum of the data and doing the comparison. And that's why it's important for us to do another webinar in the future where we'll re really drill down into that. If you do want to evaluate our compression, please, uh, please reach out to us and we'll, we'll happily um, help with that too. Once again, if you have any questions, um, please post them to the Q&A chat window and we'll be happy to ask them. So I have another question here. Uh, does the adaptive streaming quality change automatically based on the network bandwidth such as video streaming, etc.? That's a fantastic question. Um, no, it doesn't, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we couldn't do that. And I think that where that would apply is if you were looking at more of a 3D volume and you are going through the 3D volume and suddenly the bandwidth really drops, um, it could, could apply that on the fly. But right now, the, the client would have to set that themselves. But, but from a feasibility, testing the network bandwidth and recommending, um, recommending a signal quality would be something that would be very feasible to do as well. We do give the client application the control of that data. So the client, whoever's using the data, the consumer of the data, essentially gets access to that, that um, adaptive compression uh, setting. Great question. Thanks for that. Once again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and uh, put them in the chat window.
We will also uh, record this uh, webinar and post it on our website. So if you do want to share it with any of your colleagues, uh, feel free to. So um, the next question is with adaptive streaming, um, you are not making any copies right. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and that's the whole benefit is that you you store the data once in the cloud. Adaptive streaming is essentially delivering that data into the workflow. Now we do have a mechanism within our um, within our adapter tools, our fast product that you can look at that can create a cached version of the file in SegY or in ZGY or other formats as well. And I'll talk about that in another workflow, but essentially you are streaming the data into the workflow. So during those Python sessions, the data was being used in that case by the visualizations that I was showing, but the data isn't being copied um, at any point. Thank you for that. OK, we'll give a couple more minutes for a couple more questions if anyone wants to. Otherwise, we will close. OK, another question coming in here. Is VDS supported on AWS, Azure and GCP? VDS is fully supported on AWS and Azure, and we are beginning to work with Open VDS primarily on GCP, and that is really part of the Open uh, VDS initiative uh, with OSDU as well. Um, so in time, we'll have uh, we'll have uh, VDS supported on all three. The the key difference is is just um thing, things like how big you make the uh the the blobs you create the different blobs and then the authentication tokens and things like that each of the cloud vendors has has different models to uh to work on as well is your compression truly um nd or 2d paul do you want to uh do you want to take that one for me yes absolutely so actually on on the VDS, you can choose uh, uh, how many dimensions you want the blocks to be uh, compressed. Uh, you could do so, but it can be 2D or 3D. So uh, even if you have a 4D uh, four-dimensional data set, uh, you will still have, for example, 3D uh, chunks compressed adaptively. But it's 2D or 3D wavelet compression itself. So another question that's come in, if someone implements Open VDS, how easy is it to transition to VDS? The, that's, a, that's a really good question. So Open VDS is exactly the same in terms of the architecture of VDS. The two differences are when you write, and if you go back, I'll, I'll go back to um, one of my slides here to answer that and help me answer that. The two differences are writing and uh, reading. Essentially, writing the compressed volume is, is a key difference, but the volume itself, VDS doesn't actually change itself. So essentially, to transition from an open VDS to a VDS volume, would simply be a process of applying compression to the traces. So it's an iterative function of doing that. We don't have a tool right now to do that, but it would be very, very, very easy to do. And we've considered doing that ourselves as a essentially a cloud service that would give the ability to transition, um, but not, not difficult to do. So thank you for that. That was a really good question. Uh, you mentioned the clients, uh, for example, being able to read uh, VDS directly. Is that the Python modules? Um, any thought experience on running Jupyter uh, locally versus uh, the cloud? Um, yes, so essentially our Python libraries 
are, um, are are geared up to read in the VDS directly. So everything I put in there um, were, was perfectly fine. Um, reading from a client to the cloud is also very feasible as well um, because it's just a URL. So as long as your VPC connection allows you to read that um, that that object store directly and you have permission to read that object store, you can run the cloud locally. Um, it doesn't have to be in the cloud. One of the benefits of being in the cloud is the backbone of the cloud itself. So if you want that full optimized experience, um, it's really, really, really powerful to do that. Um, what that applies to is VDS having a lift and shift kind of environment. So you can have your data in the cloud, lift and shift your applications to the cloud and deliver data into them across that really fast backbone. But both are uh, feasible to do. So do so, you have... So, so, so just to add to that, uh, yeah. and uh, sure. Uh, the question you mentioned, the client being able to read VDS directly, is that the Python modules? Yeah, and the answer is yes, it's the Python API on top of the Bluebird engine. And you can read, uh, uh, so you can be locally read. Uh, it's just about how you open the VDS. Is it a file or is it a URL? And then from then, the APIs are all the same in Python. Yeah, thanks. Paul, do you want to take the next question as well? <sighs> uh, yes, uh, we do have. Uh, do you want to read it out? So do you have adaptive sizes for your compression units 2D or 3D or are they fixed? They are not fixed. You can select on the VDS uh, what layout you want on the chunks you compress. So uh, you can do 3D or 2D and you can actually do both. You can have multiple representations of the data if you really need extra fast access to time slices, for example. And uh, so VDS can also have multiple representations of the same data. Great. I think that's it for Q&A today. I really, really want to thank you uh, for your time in joining uh, today. Hopefully this was a valuable use of your time. Paul, thank you for helping me with the Q&A. Um, much appreciated always. And as I said, I will do some more of these uh, webinars in the future. We will cover uh, uh, the impact of compression. Uh, we will cover our fast transcoding of data as well. So we'll, we'll, and also our compute plugins as well, if we apply compute plugins and being able to uh, access that data. So look out for those for future uh, webinars. We will post a recording on our website and uh, thank you for your time and have a great day.